Returning to 1 Samuel chapter 27 for our scripture reading, we'll read the entire chapter of 12 verses. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish some day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. And notice those words, and it was told Saul again. Saul had an efficient central intelligence agency. Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there, for why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one year one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. You recognize this as the southern part of the land. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, Where have you made a raid today? And David would say, Against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremelites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. You understand, of course, that the reason that David did what he did was that the places that he was attacking were not places of Israel, but places that would have been normally more friendly with the Philistines. And so finally in verse 12 we read, So Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him, therefore he will be my servant forever. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. The chapel know that from time to time great stress is placed upon the sovereign grace of God. In fact, uh, some of you think that there is never a time in which it is not placed on the sovereign grace of God, and I, I would accept that uh, comment as well. But you also know that from time to time I've made reference to the fact that John Wesley whose theology is often associated with uh, Arminianism and the view that the beginning of the work of God in our hearts is actually a human work, that is, the activity of the human free will, and that God cannot work until we have of our free will responded to the provision that God has made in Christ. That's essentially the teaching of Arminianism. Mr. Wesley, both John and Charles, of course, associated with Arminianism and generally with the evangelical branch of Arminianism. 
But Jim Packer, whom we've had the occasion of having here, has in uh, several of his articles that he has written in the past, made reference to the fact that uh, in his opinion, Mr. Wesley was really a confused Calvinist and that he made statements that uh, were contradictory with one another. But nevertheless, basically, he was a believer in sovereign grace. Incidentally, in my own view, I believe that anybody who gets down upon his knees and prays and asks God to do something in the heart of his friends, or even of those of whom he does not know, is really basically a believer in the truth that God does work in the hearts of men to bring them to a decision of the will. Now this hymn that we've just sung was written by Charles Wesley, and I don't know whether you noticed the third stanza of it, but it reads this way. Now incline me to repent. Now who does the inclining? Well, it's God who does the inclining. Incline me to repent. He doesn't say, now let me of my free will repent. But even that would suggest sovereign grace. But he is even stronger. Incline me to repent. Let me now my sins lament. Well, it only illustrates the fact that if we think about divine things sooner or later, we have to become believers in sovereign grace, if not in this life, in the life to come. Now we're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 27, and the subject for today is the frailty of man after God's own heart. You know, we commonly think of biblical heroes only as models of excellence. I've wondered a bit about why that is so. You notice preachers, when they refer to the great characters of the Word of God, almost always they refer to them, that is the men of faith, as if they were only models of excellence. Peter perhaps is an, uh, an exception because his fall or falls stand out above the others. But generally speaking, we think of the great men of the Old Testament only as models of excellence. I've wondered at times why that's so. Perhaps it's due to the Westminster Abbey of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 in which the author traces the history of the Old Testament in the great characters of the Old Testament and in the case of all of them, even those whose names are not mentioned, the thing that stands out is their faith. And he praises their faith, and rightly so. But we get the impression that the Old Testament believers and, I might add also, New Testament men were models of excellence always. When we turn to the history of the church, we generally follow the same thing. You usually have people who believe in the grace of God referring to Augustine, and they refer to him almost always in laudatory terms. They refer to Luther and Calvin and Wesley and others that we know from the history of the Christian church in this era and we often, I think almost always, eulogize them in one way or another. Now when we turn to the Bible, and I'm thankful for the Bible because the Bible speaks of things as they really are. I know that individuals might say with reference to Hebrews chapter 11, but Hebrews was written after the cross of Christ. And so their faults are not mentioned because the cross has intervened. Well, that may have something to do with it, but nevertheless, when we look at the Word of God, the men of the Bible, the men and women, generally reach their intended service, their intended goal in life, which may be as a king like David, or as a servant like many of us, or ministers who minister the Word of God by discipline and the discipline of divine trials. And in David's case, that great king, that great man of faith, for that is precisely what he was, he reached 
what he did attain to by the discipline of the divine trials in which he was placed. Incessant struggling, incessant waiting for the work of God in their lives and for deliverance are the things that characterize the saints of God. And oh, the temptation to take action to relieve the trials into which God has placed us. That's one thing that we as believers must always guard against, the temptation to seek relief in ways out of harmony with Holy Scripture. There is a marvelous little statement. I'm going to repeat it, I think, twice. Temptations gain power when we fail to consider that the promises of salvation and of blessing on our toil are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Now you'll recognize that language is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And the promises of salvation and blessing being yea and amen in Christ Jesus are words that the Apostle Paul would, would certainly be sympathetic with and underline by saying it's only in Him and always in Him that the promises of salvation and of blessing are found in our lives. Now David is in the process of the trials of faith which characterized his life. And so in verse 1 through verse 4 of chapter 27, we find David seeking protection at Gath. He's had a painful struggle with Saul, and it's been incessant. And so now we read him, we read him saying, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. Now, mind you, this is the man who has been anointed by the Lord God in heaven as the king of Israel to be. So the painful struggle has taken control of him to the extent that now he's going to abandon the land and go over and live among the hostile Philistines of the land of Philistia. But look at the way the inspired writer puts it. He says, David said in his heart. Now maybe I can underline that in another way. David said in his heart that this is what he's going to do. Now in chapter 26 in verse 10 we have read as he was speaking to Saul. We didn't study this chapter because it's so much like the preceding chapter 24. And uh, in this particular chapter, incidentally, if you're interested in an exposition of that, there is one in the tape ministry on that 26th chapter, but we are skipping it in this series. David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. He was quite confident that God would take care of his opposition. But now he says in his heart, I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. The optimism that characterized him has faded. Uh, one asks the question, why? Has there been secret departure in his heart? That's usually the way in which we fall. Things begin to work in our heart, a secret kind of departure from the things of the Word of God. I could not see them. You could uh, others could not see them, but they exist down in the hearts of all of us. And the danger is always there that within the heart we'll depart from Him. The lost spirit of devotion that characterizes so many believers, so many of us. No seeking of the prophets, incidentally. No seeking of the Urim. But David says, in his heart. In other words, this idea proceeds from David. It does not proceed from the Lord God. He said in his heart. Now notice what he says. He says, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. We hear a lot today about one's self-image, self-esteem, 
the self-concept that we should have of ourselves. And psychologists like to think that that really is the solution to most of our problems, if we have a proper self-image. Well, if that's true, one can say that David's self-image has been shattered. His self-esteem has vanished. There's no one around to stroke him a bit, as we are told we ought to have someone around to stroke us a bit, because we like those strokes, don't we? Yes, we do like those strokes. But we don't need a lot of the strokes with which we are struck. And uh, when we talk about self-esteem, you know, it's important to like yourself. If you don't like yourself, nobody else will. John's problem, that's any John, not the apostle. John's problem is his poor self-concept. These are the kinds of things that we read. We hear them from the postman, we hear them from the taxi driver, we hear them from the plumber. It's the good news of the psychological gospel. Should we like ourselves? Well, that depends. Depends upon how we're behaving, what kind of life we are living. People will behave badly, says the Christian, naturally, because human nature is twisted. It's warped. And so left to ourselves, we'll always veer from the truth of the Word of God. Liking yourself does not remove the twist of human nature which we receive from the fall. Psychological theory, however, has no place for the fall. Well, I know you might say, well, there are some, psych there are some Christians who are psychologists. Yes, they are. And there may be a few that are very fine. And some do acknowledge there is such a thing as the fall. But generally speaking, even among the Christians, it does not have the kind of fundamental place that it should have in their theory. So, to most, there are no bad natural inclinations. In other words, you wouldn't play, pray as Wesley did, incline my heart to repent. There's something the matter with the heart when it needs inclining to repent, is there not? Even Wesley would acknowledge that. Christianity says we are of great worth. So does psychology. So then, should we accept psychologists' newer insights about self-love, we are told? Well, we are also told God's an understanding therapist who only wants us to love ourselves for what we are. T.S. Eliot, I think, was a little more on the point when he gave us the picture of the Lord Jesus as the wounded surgeon, wounded by the cross of Calvary, the wounded surgeon who operates on us because we don't need a pat on the back, but we need an operation, what someone has called a heart transplant. That's really what we do need. If humanist psychology is right, my Christian friend, then Christianity is not necessary. You can forget all about it. We should have biblical self-regard for these reasons. We are God's creation, and what He created is good. We are part of God's divine purpose of the ages. We are objects of divine redemption, not because we're worthy, but in because of what He's done. And we should think of ourselves as those who are important, not because of what we are, but because of what He's going to make of us by virtue of redemption. That's the kind of self-esteem we should have. The self-esteem grounded in the promises of God and grounded in what God is doing for us through the crucified Savior. In other words, Christianity would have us feel good about ourselves, but not, but not until there's something good, something to feel good about. Please remember that. Please remember that. And there is only something to feel good about 
when by God's grace our hearts have been inclined to repent and we have turned to our Lord and have come to be in Him and therefore our destiny. Well, our position now is seated in Him at the right hand of the throne of God and our destiny is ultimately to be there. Now, if one keeps that before him, then all believers will have the proper self-image and it will be an exalted one, no doubt. Our Lord's greatest wrath wasn't directed at obvious sinners like Mary Magdalene, but at those who were convinced of their own worth. Please remember that. Please remember that. Those who had the greatest self-esteem were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was toward them that our Lord directed His wrath. He never asked His disciples to have self-confidence, but He always ask them to have faith in Him. There's not the slightest hint in the New Testament that we should have faith in ourselves. Now when I look at this text here, that all comes to my mind. Now I shall perish someday. David, you've forgotten something. You've forgotten the promises of God. You've forgotten precisely what God is going to do in the light of those great promises. And so he fears. Michael Pritchard said, fear is that little dark room where negatives are developed. And when we forget the promises of God and fear takes over, then the negatives flow forth. So we read secondly in verse 2, Then David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maoch, the king of Gath. Now please pay attention to the evident state of David's mind. Fear of coming danger, fear of Saul, distrust of God's care. Listen, this is the man who wrote these words. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom? Shall I be afraid? This is the individual who is saying, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul, having been given the promise of God that he's going to be the king. This is the person who's discouraged. Someone has said he sounds very much like the statement that Ezekiel makes in the vision of the valley of dry bones in which he has Israel saying, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. And the rest of that account is the story of the great future that the nation Israel has. So here is David, and he's fearing. David, of all people. What were the influences that brought it about? about? Well, there were external and physical ones. Saul was there. There's no question about that. He was there. He's something to take into account. There is the mental and emotional kind of influence, perplexity. What is God doing with me? He said, I was anointed to be the king, but why am I not king? I'm sure there was perplexity and natural perplexity. Lack of sympathy, perhaps, from others. There were moral and spiritual reasons. He just said in chapter 6, 26, verses 19 and 20, Now therefore, Saul, please let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. That's all I am. That's his self-image at the present time. He's a flea, as when one hunts a partridge on the mountains. So there were reasons, no doubt, for David's problem. But what was interesting to me, too, is that he thought that nothing could be better than getting into the land of the Philistines. Have you noticed that? He said, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me 
than I, that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. He thought nothing could be better than being down there with Achish and the Philistines, mortal enemies of the children of Israel, but in reality nothing could be worse than being down there among the Philistines. My Christian friend, guard against the causes of despondency. Guard against unbelief. Turn to the Lord in prayer when you find yourself despondent. That's the way to turn. Take no hasty steps. Be strong in the strength that is in Christ Jesus. Now there's one other point of interest here in this first section. In verse 4, it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. Now that's rather interesting. You'll notice Saul didn't leave his sins. His sins left him. Let me underline that. Saul didn't leave his sins. His sins left him. Saul's heart's still the same, but he's not going to follow David anymore. In fact, if they had a Nobel Prize in those days, Saul would have won the Nobel Prize for peace because he stopped chasing David. It's like a man we know. You know, the man who is supposed to be responsible for perestroika, who is given the Nobel Peace Prize because he's not murdering and butchering anymore. Isn't that interesting? Gorbachev gets the Nobel Peace Prize because he's not as mean as he used to be. He's telling us he's no longer mean, and I do believe he's no longer mean, but the reason he's mean, pardon the politics, but it's because Ronald Reagan made him that way with what he did in building up our forces and standing up against the evil of Soviet Russia. So you give Gorbachev the Nobel Peace Prize, and what does Reagan get? He gets the criticisms of the media. It's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. So we read here, it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. Give him a prize, but he hasn't turned to follow the Lord. Saul's still the same old Saul. You can be sure of that. Now, we leave politics. I hope for the rest of the message. In the next few verses, verses 5 through 7, David is given Ziklag. And you'll notice the sin and the peril of expediency. Oh, how Christians easily fall into expediency. We do what's expedient, what seems to be better to us, what's really what, that which is not better at all. But here, after all, David is a man whose heart's different. His basic loyalty is to Israel. Don't forget that. We said a lot about how he's departed practically from what he really truly has in his mind and heart. We're treating him as if he's a believing man. And so consequently, his basic loyalty is to Israel. He's like believers who wander away into sin, but whose basic commitment is to the Lord God by virtue of what Christ has done. And so in this case, David basically is loyal to Israel. And so as he comes to Achish in Gath, he said, King Achish, is it not possible for you to give me some place in which I may dwell because it's really not the place for me to dwell in the royal city with you. Achish knew a lot about David. All that he knew we're not told in the Word of God, but he knew enough about him to know he was important. And uh, David, of course, was trying to avoid surveillance. He wanted to be there in Philistia, but he still wanted to have fundamental loyalty to Israel. And so what he's doing is compromising, following the path of expediency, 
One sin leads to another and still another. And if we persist in it, it will continue. And you'll be surprised at how far a devoted, fervent Christian can become as sin after sin develops. So, Achish, give me a place to say, stay. So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. It was right on the border and belonged to Judah originally. Now, the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was 16 months. This was a self-chosen means of safety. Forced, shameful suppression of his true character. The Word of God says that we are not to be conformed to the world, but we are to be transformed. And here is David, God's great servant, now dwelling among the Philistines, expediently dwelling among them, hiding what he's doing, deceiving. You know, it's impossible, my Christian friend, to live among the unbelieving, to give your lives to life among the unbelieving. It's impossible to do that without being affected. That's why it's so important for believing Christians to be with believing Christians. And the very idea of a believing Christian fellowshipping with unbelieving religious people. Mind you, I'm not talking about fellowshipping with unbelieving people winning them to the Lord, but fellowshipping with unbelieving religious people in their religious organization. It never works. It will never work. It's futile. We are told in the Word of God that believers are not to have fellowship with the world. Not simply one, <clears throat> but the apostles and the friends of our Lord and the brother of our Lord also say the same thing. James says in chapter 4 and verse 4 of his book, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The Apostle John in the second chapter of his first epistle in verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That lesson is for the individuals, and it's for the church of Jesus Christ. We shall never be able to do what God intends for us to do if we compromise our testimony to Jesus Christ. Those of you in this audience, many of you have heard John Gerstner. Dr. Gerstner was in the Presbyterian Church for many years, very prominent. I think I made reference to this previously, but it fits here as well. He was very prominent in the workings of the Presbyterian Church, attending their general assemblies, and being on some important committees as professor of church history in one of their institutions. He sat in our home here in Dallas and told us five or six years ago that he would not leave the Presbyterian Church until the Presbyterian, Presbyterian Church officially left the faith. He said, I know that it's filled with unbelievers. I know it's in the hands of unbelievers. He told me one time I don't attend the General Assembly anymore because they never pay attention to anything I say. He said, they very calmly reject everything I suggest, and in the hall they laugh at me afterwards because they have the numbers, and they vote down everything that I think is true to the Word of God. But recently, Dr. Gerstner left the Presbyterian Church. I was very much interested in that because I wanted to know exactly why he had finally, after all of these years, in retirement. Well, that church has officially come out with a document which does not specifically endorse the Trinity. 
does not specifically endorse a few other things that Dr. Gerstner has believed and so he officially and uh, went out of his way to make it public that to his mind that church, the PCUSA, was no longer a Christian church because the things that mark a Christian church are the ministry of the Word of God, second, the observance of the ordinances, and third, the, the observance of biblical discipline. The Word of God, the ordinances, biblical discipline. And so now he's sought membership in and received in the Presbyterian Church in America, which has remained true to the Word of God. The things that one finds in the Word of God over and over again illustrate the fact that if we fellowship with unbelievers, we are sure to be affected by them. I'm not talking about the unbeliever that you encounter in the grocery store, in the drug store, or among your friends whom you're seeking to win for the Lord, but in religious organizations committed to that which is contrary to Holy Scripture. The last part of our chapter is a detailed account of David's, David's deceit while he was at Ziklag. And so we read, David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Shur, even as, you, as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, now notice what he did. He left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. So he brutally slew everybody man, woman, and child, in those raids of his. The reason? Well, he was afraid that there might be someone who would tell Achish what he was really doing. He was not fighting the battles of Achish. He was fighting his own. While Achish thinks, as someone has put it, that David is fighting his battles, the wily Judahite is frying his own fish in anticipation of the time when he will be king of Judah. So here is his unbelief, his failure, now leads to the brutal slaughter of individuals in the deceit that is necessary by his position. This is the second time he's tricked Achish. You'd think that Achish might learn. You cannot trust the wily Judahite. But nevertheless, Achish believed him. He thought David was doing things that were good for Philistia, but they really were things to maintain him until the opportunity arose for him to be what he knew he would be by God's word, ultimately king of Israel. This is a disreputable episode in the life of David. And if you put yourself down in the midst of it and realize the kind of man that David was by God's intention and by the manifestations of faith earlier, you can see how deep he had fallen into sin. What's David's chief fault? It's very simple. The Word of God is very simple. We don't have to make it difficult with modern lectures that are sometimes impossible for us to comprehend. David's chief fault is unbelief. He failed at his strongest point. To this point has been his faith. This is the individual who, as he puts it, God delivered him from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. This is the one who said to Goliath, you come to me with sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That's what he needed to remember, that there is a God in Israel. 
Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. This is the one who wrote Psalm 27, verse 1 through verse 4. This is the one who now takes counsel with himself. He said, The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though the war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Ah, David, that's what you haven't been doing. You haven't been dwelling in the temple of the Lord and beholding the beauty of the Lord, or you wouldn't be following this policy of brutal carnage, pillage, and deceit arising out of a despondency that is rooted in unbelief. Take counsel with yourself. How often have we taken counsel with ourselves? Noah, what a tremendous man of faith, stood against the world, built his ark amid all of the scorn and mockery. And then afterwards, after he's won his great victory, from his standpoint, how does he fail? In temperance. Moses, the meekest of all men, great follower of the Lord God. And Moses, well, Moses fails also at Kadesh. And there gets so angry he loses his temper and is not allowed to enter into the land. Hezekiah, man of faith, man of great faith, but loses his fellowship with the Lord by his boasts and then is put to shame. Simon Peter, we all know the story of Simon. My Christian friend, it's easy to decline. It's easy to depart from the Word of God. I dare say some of you in this audience probably are living in that state right now, a state of decline. Your devotion is not what it should be. You've not been in the temple beholding the beauty of the Lord, the freshness of the vitality that you felt when you came to know the Lord is no longer there, or the effectiveness of your Christian witness is gone. We may get our ziklags to dwell in, but that path leads to presumptuous sins and one right after the other. Did you notice this fact, or did you know this fact? I must confess I didn't know this. Not a single one of David's psalms can be referred to this period. Isn't that interesting? So his unbelief led to unworthy action. Better the caves, the forests of Judea, than the prosperous life of the pirate and the plunderer in an unbelieving society. Little prayer leads to self-guidance, to pillage, to slaughter, to deceitful lies. There's a straight line that exists from despondency to dishonesty to duplicity and deceit. Yes, the promises of the Lord God have their yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Bunyan, if I may conclude, conclude with this, Bunyan in his holy war has an interesting account of the town of Mansoul and when it was in the devil's power. Incredulity in Mansoul was made first alderman and then the Lord Mayor of the town of Mansoul. But when Emmanuel took the town, incredulity or unbelief was doomed to execution, but managed to break out of prison and lurked in hiding places where he could not be found. When the devil assaulted the town in hopes to retake it, all incredulity, Bunyan has reappearing and was made general of the army. <laughs> General of the army, you can see incredulity leading the army against the city or town of Mansoul. 
And after the assailing army was defeated and many of the officers and soldiers in it were put to death, unbelief still evaded capture. And so Bunyan had him still dwelling in man's soul, though he, quote, hid in dens and holes, unquote. That's what unbelief does. It hides in the dens and holes of the human heart of the believer. It hides in dens and holes of the work of God. And there's always the tendency of the devil to seek to win back the town of man's soul. Matthew Henry said, but unbelief is a sin that easily besets even good men when without our fightings, within our fears. And it's a hard matter to get over them. Lord, increase our faith. That's my prayer. And I know in the Word of God it says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So I don't want to get down on my knees and say, Lord, increase my faith without reading the Word of God. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So don't get down on your knees if you will receive some advice from me. It's not worth too much, except by experience. Don't get down on your knees and say, Lord, increase my faith, if you neglect the source of faith, the meditation on the Word of God. That's what God says. If you're here today and you've never believed in Christ, we remind you that the Lord Jesus has come. He's offered the atoning sacrifice for sinners. Such we are. The sacrifice is for sinners. And so if God in His marvelous grace through the Holy Spirit has pointed out to you the necessity of deliverance from your sins, Christ is the one to whom you turn. May God incline your heart to repent. As Mr. Wesley said, let's stand for the benediction. Father, we are grateful to Thee for the Word of God, and we thank Thee for these great lessons repeated over and over again so that we, in our simple-minded approach to the things of life, may understand. Lord, if there are some here who have never believed in Christ, may they at this moment turn to Him. For those who have believed in Him, but who perhaps are wandering, O oh God, return us to the devotion and the eager longing to know Thee better that has characterized us in the past. For Jesus' sake, amen.